It's Shirley. Thank you for joining me on the Get What You Want podcast, where getting what you want isn't always what you think it is. My wish for you is that this show will create an awareness within yourself of what you really want and the possibility of getting it. Let's go create. My guest today is Morel Guillen. He is a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an expert on global market trends, and his most recent book came out in August. It's called 2030, How Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Change the Future of Everything, which is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Welcome, Laura. I'm super excited to have you. Thank you so much, Shirley, for inviting me to your podcast. Yes, I... So I admittedly have kind of been out of it a little bit with all of everything that's going on. Like, I think we all have, a, you know, to an extent. And I, I, I'm always a little bit nervous to talk about politics and trends and all of that. But I think it's so relevant right now, especially just like with all, there's so many different aspects going on in our world right now. So tell me a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, you know, where you came from. And then I want to move into a little bit more about your book too. Okay, uh, so I am a professor, uh, meaning that I spend most of my time thinking about, uh, in my particular case, the world of business and how markets are evolving and changing uh, on a global basis. Uh, and uh, I have an accent, as I'm sure you can detect. Uh, I am from Spain originally. I came to this country more than 30 years ago. And of course, I was attracted by all of the opportunities uh, that this great uh, place has to has to offer, um, and um, I should also perhaps uh, mention um, that uh, I have a a very very big interest in thinking about the future, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that although we should uh, also take a, a lot of care and uh, understand very well the past and of course the present, it's extremely important every now and then to raise the perspective a little bit and to see okay where are we going. And I think at this particular point in time, we all need to do a little bit more of that in spite of the, you know, very urgent difficulties that we're facing uh, because we are in the midst of so much change and transformation in the world. Oh, I agree. I think, I think that, you know, we're, we're such a like society focused on the present, like live in the present, stay in the present, that type of thing that I think that we just don't, we don't really pay attention to what we're doing to our future, right? Like, like kind of what we're creating going forward. And I think that we do a little bit or we'll set future goals in that, but your book is called 2030. <laughs> so I think a long time ago, I didn't know that I would ever even see that day. It seemed like it was just so far away. And now here it is in 10 years from now. So tell me a little bit about your book and what brought you to write it. And, you know, just like maybe a small summary about what it's about. Yeah, so Shirley, as a, as a professor, of course, I spend a lot of time also uh, making presentations. Um, so oftentimes it's my students, uh, but I also, um, you know, three or four times a year, I make presentations and I have high school students in the, in the audience. Uh, and of course, also executives and policymakers. And I've been doing that in intensively since about seven years ago, uh, mm -hmm. telling them about where I think the world is going, what is it that they need to take into account if they want to be successful, and so on. And uh, I started to detect that people were getting very anxious about the future, uh, that they were seeing, oh my goodness, there's so many changes going on. Uh, you know, the most obvious ones are, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, what's going on with China? What's going on with, uh, um, you know, the rights of women in society? What's going on with technology and all of these things? And so that was when I decided to write a book because I thought that people needed a little bit of perspective, a little bit of a guidance as to how to think, right? So I think the book, besides uh, the year 2030, it really um, helps you think about uh, the future, put your arms around it. And the year 2030 is a pivotal year in my analysis because uh, by then, look, surely we're going to be in a very different world. I sometimes joke uh, that the world we're in, the world in which you and I grew up, it's going to be gone, right? We are really witnessing the end of the world as we know it. And by the year 2030, we're going to be in a radically different situation. And unless we start thinking about that now, unless we start adjusting to it now, then it's going to be too late by the time, you know, we reach that year. And, and what are you talking about? Like, 
radically different. Can you give me some ideas of what that might look like? Yeah, so something uh, very, very simple. Things such as, for example, by the year 2030 here in the United States and also in some other parts of the world, we're going to have more grandparents than grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> so why is that? Well, because, hey, um, people are living longer, uh, and that's a great thing. Uh, but also, for the longest time, we've been having fewer and fewer babies over time. So therefore, each new generation uh, in many parts of the world, not just here in the United States, but also in China, in Europe, in Japan, uh, each generation is smaller than the previous generation. Mm. And that's unusual. Uh, and it is getting us into a situation that I'm not going to complain about it, but it is a situation that we need to you know, think about carefully because there are some implications, for example, about the viability of uh, pension systems. Uh, or about, um, you know, who are going to be the most important consumers in the market. Uh, and let me just uh, give you another example. By the year 2030, Africa is going to be the second biggest region in the world by population. Uh, and you see, Africa, you know, it's a big place, but didn't used to have that many people. Uh, but since they're having more babies than we are, and also they're seeing their life expectancy grow, um, they're going to become more important. And so by the year 2030, we're not going to be able to ignore Africa any longer. For better or worse, we're going to have to really think about what role we want Africa to play in the, in the world. Uh, so these are just two examples. There's so many things going on. I mean, we can talk about technology. We can talk about so many things. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't know. I love Africa. I got to go there and it, and it does seem like there's just so much space that's not, that does not have people in it. And, you know, like, it's kind of crazy to think of it that way. I already am a grandma. I have three grandbabies. So I, yeah, the thought of that being our truth in 10 years, that's, that's a little bit scary. <laughs> the other, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, it is. I mean, it is a scary, I think it is, uh, it will be a challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, um, there are also um, things that are going well. I mean, women now have better opportunities and they have careers and all of that. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, but once again, yes, I mean, so more and more women now are postponing having their first baby. And if they postpone it, for example, here in the United States on average until um, age uh, 28 or 29, uh, then, you know, maybe they have one baby or they have two. They don't have three or four or five. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there are all I'm saying is there are implications of this. I'm not necessarily saying that I would go. I would like to go back to where we were. Of course not. I think it's wonderful that women have opportunities available to them. Uh, but we have to plan for the implications of all of that. Yeah. So I think it's just a creating some type of awareness. Right. So that we know how to. I guess gracefully walk into <laughs> the future, right? I came from a family of seven kids and I have seven kids. And so I, yeah, it's, that's not something you actually hear about ever anymore. So I get that. Talk, let's talk about women. I love that because I work with women and I think that, you know, that's always just kind of exciting to me. What, what are your predictions or, you know, what is, what does the research say on the future of women in our country? I mean, in yeah. the world even. Yeah, so uh, let me give you two numbers about it, which I think are, at least for me, mind-boggling. So today, as we speak, Shirley, here in the United States, in about 41% of American households, the woman makes more money than the men. Okay? Wow. That's a fact today. Uh, look, when you and I were growing up, uh, we were very far from that level, right? Yeah, for sure. uh, it was a man's world. Uh, men were the main breadwinners in virtually every household, mm -hmm. right, around the world, not just here in the United States. And the prediction is by, that by the year 2030, in more than half, right, of American households, the women will be making more money than the men. So today is 41%, yeah. by the year 2030, it may be uh, a little bit more than 50%. And I think that's going to change everything. It's going to change consumption. Oh, it's sure. going to change savings, investing, because women and men are different. We come from different planets. Let's face it, right? And uh, I think it's very important to understand what some of the implications are. And I always say, surely, that the single most important difference between men and women is our attitude towards risk. Um, men tend to be more of risk takers and women more risk averse. And that changes your entire attitude about money management in terms of consumption, saving, and investing. Yeah, I could, I mean, I could go on forever about not just the financial, political, you know, demographical but like the mental the you know we're i just see a completely different world if women 
are over 50% of the breadwinners, right? Like I, I like that's a whole nother show probably for me, but it like, I'm just starting to think now you have me thinking about our future. Um, but yeah, so what, what we're, we're just getting really close to the election right now. And I remember I was very involved in the election in 2016. My kids were in it, you know, like we were all there involved, like listening to the debates and everything. What's different right now from then? And then what's going to be different in 2030? Look, uh, when it comes to politics, um, I think the electorate in this country is changing very quickly, right? Um, so first of all, as you know, this time around, it seems as if uh, the most important group of voters who could be deciding the election is suburban women. Um, so both campaigns are focusing very much on that demographic. Because if you remember back in 2016, in spite of the fact that uh, Hillary uh, Clinton was running, uh, there was a uh, you know, significant proportion of women in the suburbs who voted for President Trump. And this time around, uh, some of them have changed their mind, others have not. Uh, but it seems to me one of the most uh, contested uh, demographic groups. Uh, in this election. The other big thing, which um, I'm sure since you live in Arizona, this is something that you can feel, not just a study through the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, we have, um, you know, young people uh, becoming first time voters in a presidential election, uh, more than 15 million throughout the United States. And increasingly that group is more diverse. So we have more Hispanics, more African Americans, more Asian Americans, mm -hmm. more Native Americans in that group, uh, to the point that this time around, uh, 50 uh, 3% of those new young voters who are casting their vote for the first time in a presidential election uh, are um, non-Hispanic whites. So in other words, nearly 50%, 47% are members of minority groups. And of course, by the next um, election, presidential election in 2024, it will be for the first time in history, um, more minorities than not in that younger age group of first time voters in a presidential election. Um, so as you know, also the two campaigns are fighting right very hard oh my gosh. for the votes of uh, minorities. And, um, you know, uh, it's still, I guess, uh, unclear as to whom they will support in big numbers. So there's lots of changes going on. I mean, uh, it is, I think, um, easy to say or to argue uh, relatively straightforward um, that this country is changing very quickly. And that's one big dimension along which it's changing. And uh, we just also consider women. So there's a lot of things that are changing. Yeah, I get that. And would you say, because I have a 17 year old right now that listened to the debate, he's like him, even while he and his friends are playing video games, they're, they've got the debate streaming in the background. So would you say like from my point of view, which is very small, I see kids younger and younger being involved in this also. And so is our voting age going down right now? Because I feel like they seem to be a lot more involved on social media, on, you know, and their opinions and like their own, their rights. And I, I just see that. Is that something that you're seeing also? Yes. Uh, look, um, uh, the group of young people is very heterogeneous. Uh, of course, within that group, we have people who, have uh, relatively stable family backgrounds, you know, middle class and above, and they have resources, they attend good schools and so on and so forth. Uh, as you said, they spend an enormous amount of time on social media and video games and all of that, but they're very good at multitasking. So I wouldn't be surprised if your children uh, that age, uh, you know, your child uh, is, um, uh, you know, actually paying attention, right? Because they're very, very good at, uh, you know, following two or more things at the same time. Right. And then, of course, we have other children that are not as privileged and that they're suffering, especially now in the midst of a pandemic because they cannot go to school. And let's not forget, um, you know, uh, 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 15, 20 percent of them used to get their lunch at school, right? Because they cannot really have a good lunch at home. So I think uh, we need to be, um, you know, careful in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the experiences, the background, the family support, uh, the different types of young people have in the country. Uh, but what I would say in terms of their political behavior, what I detect is that they're very, very sensitive to environmental matters and in particular climate change. And I'm sure that um, in Arizona and other parts of the United States, people can see some TV ads about, um, uh, you know, interest groups that are advertising not, um, you know, in favor of a particular political candidate in this election, but rather saying, look, don't forget about young people, about teenagers, 
because they cannot vote right now. So your your boy cannot vote right now. Right. Uh, but they do have views. And uh, of course, their argument always is, we're going to be on this planet longer than the people who vote, right? Because we're younger. And so it's important, I think, to, as you said, put ourselves in the shoes of um, the younger generation who can still not vote, but they do have an interest and increasingly, I think, a political consciousness about some big issues in the world. And then moving forward, they are going to be the ones that are voting. Of course. And they're going to be also the candidates themselves, right? Uh, They're going to be the voters and they're going to be defining all the issues. Uh, You see, uh, this is the interesting thing when you take the long view, right? So each generation comes of age at some point. And like every generation, they have some experience that defines them, right? So, you know, the best example, of course, is the generation from the Great Depression or World War II, the greatest generation. Uh, You know, those events really defined uh, their entire lives. Uh, But think about, uh, for example, the younger generation that we have that was born in a digital world. That if you tell them, you know, that uh, we used to, uh, for example, make phone calls with a rotary phone, they just don't know what we're talking about. It's like, what do you mean by rotary, right? Okay. Uh, And (laughs) Yeah. So there's so many things that um, I think in their experience, uh, even though many of them have only been around for 10, 15 or 20 years, are so different from the way in which you and I were brought up, for example, really makes a big difference, right? I mean, for them, being connected 24-7 is not a possibility. It's a fact of life. That's the way they live their lives. They're connected 24-7, right? And that is a very different kind of uh, situation than, you know, uh, like, for example, when I wanted to see my friends, I would need to call each of them in succession using a rotary phone. It would take me like an hour, you know, to contact all of them and tell them, hey, why don't we go out, right? (laughs) Yeah. Or we'd have to walk, I, like I didn't even have a phone growing up. So we'd have to walk down to the phone booth at the pharmacy on the corner. If I wanted to make a friend, I'd have, I'd have, or call a friend, I'd have to babysit, earn my money to go down to make, to pay to make my phone call that I could only talk for five minutes or whatever. So yeah, yeah the kids are like, wait, what? How old are you, mom? Like, <laughs> and it, that changed so quickly. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, just thinking about that, And I, you know, I keep seeing this 2030 on your screen here. And it's like, if that changed so quickly, what, what is changing like from now till 10 years from now? That's, it's crazy to think about, you know, we've talked about the demographic and we, you know, and, and would you say, like, I feel like I'm covering so many subjects, but would you say that the coronavirus is going to be one of those very defining moments for these kids, our kids? Yes. Are you feeling stuck in your relationship? Do you feel you need more? Whether it be more time, attention, security, gifts, intimacy, or companionship, your partner is likely experiencing something similar, yet both of you are not sure how to fix it. In Shirley Baldwin's best-selling book, Get What You Want From Your Man, she will show you how to get all of this and more. Get What You Want From Your Man is available nationwide through all major bookstores, Amazon.com, and through her website, www.getwhatyouwantguru.com. Yeah, so um, that's a great question, Shirley. Let me just make uh, two quick points. So first is uh, this millennial generation that we've been talking about for the last 10 years or so. And, um, you know, before the pandemic, I think we were still, um, you know, making fun out of them, right? It's like how different they are and look at these crazy things that they do yeah. and so on and so forth. And look, I think uh, we need to be a little bit more compassionate about this uh, millennial generation because this is the second big economic crisis that they've been going through in their adult lives. The first one was 12 years ago, the global financial crisis. And now when, you know, they were uh, starting to enjoy again a good labor market and all of that, this big pandemic hits and we have uh, all of the economic fallout from it. Uh, so I think uh, we need to, um, you know, uh, be conscious of that, that uh, this generation is being hit twice so early in their lives. And I think that's going to be what defines their generation, much more so than technology. But the second quick point uh, to your more specific question about how does the pandemic change things? Look, the pandemic is really an acceleration of trends, right? So the pandemic accelerates our use of technology out of necessity, of course. Uh, you and I are using technology now 
maybe before the pandemic, um, you know, there was a chance that maybe we would, you would interview me uh, face to face or you were interviewing some, at least some of your guests mm -hmm. face to face. Uh, and uh, the pandemic also uh, reduces the number of babies even further, by the way, because people are postponing such a big decision such as that, maybe because they've lost their jobs. So as a result, then population aging advances more quickly, right? So it's a big accelerator of all of these trends. And uh, you see, after having written this book and uh, incorporated some of those insights about the pandemic into it, uh, my only regret is that instead of uh, calling it 2030, surely I should have called it 2028 because the future is arriving earlier, right? The, right. the effect of this pandemic is faster um, progression towards this kind of future that is awaiting us. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So, so what was your purpose for writing the book? Is it to have people be aware or like what, what was your main purpose? So first of all, as you know, every writer wants to make sense out of a big problem, right? And uh, for me, uh, it's always been the case that when I write a book, I am trying myself to understand what's going on, right? Uh, given a particular topic. And in this case, I was also to a certain extent confused and a little bit anxious about uh, this combination of uh, threats and opportunities that I think every major transformation brings. Uh, but my uh, role or my purpose in terms of publishing the book, of course, is to provide people with uh, some guidance, with a roadmap, if you will. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, what are the kinds of things that you really need to take into consideration? And the book is just a, a, a big attempt to bring to the attention of people things that I think they need to know before it's too late so that they can adjust. That's essentially the purpose of the book. That's what motivated me to write it. I love that. So if you were to give one word of advice to our guests that are listening today about how they could effectively, I guess, positively affect the future, what would that be? Look, um, I think um, the piece of advice would be the following, and I'm taking it out of the concluding chapter in the book. It's something very simple. But let me tell you before I specify exactly what it is, that our human tendency always is when we see so much change is to go to one of the extremes. We either freeze completely and we say, whoa, look at all of that change. I'm not going to move. I'm going to stay exactly where I am, mm -hmm. right? That's uh, one uh, way in which our human instincts manifest themselves, going to that extreme. Or alternatively, some people go to the other extreme, which is, okay, so I see that so many things are changing. I'm going to change everything in my life, right? Uh, so I'm going to get another degree. I'm going to divorce. I'm going to move, uh, you know, to a different part of the country. I'm going to switch jobs. I'm going to... And I think we need to be disciplined and try to avoid either extreme. And let me just summarize what the golden rule for me is. And this is what I would like your listeners to consider. And this is the message of the book in the end. Don't make any decisions that are irreversible, okay? If you make a big decision in the midst of all of this change, you should always make sure that you can reverse that decision. Because if you cannot, then you're most likely running yourself into a situation in which your assumptions as to what was going to happen could be wrong, and then you are in big trouble, right? So yeah. never make a decision that you cannot walk back, that you cannot, you know, alter. Uh, you need to be able to course correct when there's so much transformation. And once again, our human instincts, we are wired in our brains to go to the extremes, right? So some people freeze. Some people just say, oh, I'm going to change everything, right? And it's very important to chart a path, right? Uh, that is uh, somewhere in between those two extremes. And once again, never make a decision that is irreversible. I love that. I, I, when I work with couples or individuals, whatever, I always say, you know, they always come to me and they're like, I just can't decide if I'm in or out or if I'm this or that. And I'm like, right. why do you have to decide? How about we look at the 25 things in between those two, right? There's like yeah. 25 different. I think it's the, it's the Hamlet uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, problem, right? I mean, we yeah. tend to, um, f you know, in our minds, we tend to frame many problems or many decisions in terms of uh, to be or not to be, right? Yes. yes. Uh, either, you know, all in or all out. And especially when things are changing, and um, you know, uh, I think you, you proposed a very good example of that, which is when a couple has problems, right? 
-hmm. Well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do, right? To try to see right. if, um, you know, things improve. And uh, uh, sure, in some situations, maybe you, go, you need to go to the extreme, but most of the time you don't have to. Right. It's not like there's necessarily like a date or an emergent, like a deadline or, you know, and I think that, I think people do feel like that. And, and you make a point that it's just human tendency because I feel like every single person that I meet, it's like, am I in or out? Do I quit my job or do I stay? Do I quit my marriage or do I stay? You know, do I, and, and I just always think, what if we just stopped <laughs> pause for a minute and then like look at all the other options. And I think most of the time people aren't even aware that there are other options. Absolutely. And, right. And so the other thing is like during COVID, I feel like I, I felt very blessed during the lockdown. I had my, I had 10 people living in my house, my oldest daughter, her husband, their two babies, and they joined us for four months because their house wasn't finished and COVID kind of slowed things down. And you know, we thought it could be just this horrible thing and end up being the most beautiful experience. And I keep telling everyone it was just beautiful chaos. And I've not, I tell everyone that I have not been affected negatively by COVID, but like even just the last couple of weeks, like all these months later, you know, I'm feeling like intolerant or agitated or something. And I'm like, maybe it's because I, we had to pause our landscaping and there's just dirt outside. Or maybe it's because I haven't been out of my house for a long time. Or maybe it is because I'm not meeting people. Like before COVID, I was, I had a flight to New York. I was going to be on a, on a well-known New York TV show. And instead they canceled that. I was on the show on the New York TV show while he was in Florida with his family. Cause he wanted to get out of New York too. <laughs> and so it was just interesting. Like you say, how we turned to this, you know, everything just went on, on online. I did some of mine online, but I haven't really had a ton of in face to face people like connecting like that. And so I think that a lot of people don't even realize that they're going through something or that it really is affecting their decision making. If it's not some major, again, like some big major thing that they have some big extreme, they think that they're not going through something. And so, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, uh, you know, this business of uh, social distancing mm -hmm. and just uh, the fear that, of course, we all have in terms of uh, catching the virus and then going back home. And uh, imagine in your case, I mean, you have uh, several generations of people in your home. Mm -hmm. What if somebody brings the virus? I think uh, that's what's really, you know, um, difficult to deal with uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, there's a lot of fear wrapped around that. And being a mom, like I want to control everybody and make sure that, you know, it doesn't work like that. So... <laughs> But, um, well, I am just so excited for your book and for you to be here. Is it out yet? Yes. Um, yes, the book came out in uh, August, uh, okay. so about a month ago. And, of course, it's available everywhere where books are sold, whether it's online or at your local independent bookstore. And, uh, Shirley, I would also like to say, if it's okay, that uh, if any of your listeners wants to uh, start a conversation with me um, using either social media like LinkedIn or Facebook or email, uh, I'm always available. I mean, I love to hear from people who are interested in thinking about the uh, future and thinking about trends that are going to change our lives. Uh, so they can just uh, Google me and they can find uh, my email and uh, all of my contact information. And it would be amazing to be able to continue uh, the conversation. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that a lot. So thank you so much. I, you definitely got me thinking for sure. <laughs> I'm like, wait. I'm going to, we're going to have more grand grandparents and grandkids. That's like so crazy to think of all that. So anyway, thank you so much for being here. I'm super grateful for you. And I'm sure that there will be people reaching out to you. Thank you so much, Shirley, for having me. It's been uh, really wonderful. Thanks so much for listening to the Get What You Want podcast. If you loved it, please subscribe, share it with others, and leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also visit me on my website at www.getwhatyouwantguru.com. Would love to hear from you. Now go create.